uh, they were a remarkable group. Uh, uh, Abalone will turn out later in my uh, tale, but I remember Lionel Robbins telling me how he went to visit uh, uh, Abalone in, in, in his flat in the East End to discuss the theory of uh, international trade. Well, Abalone was discussing the theory of international trade when Lionel Robbins noticed that the twins, uh, Lionel and, and Marion, were busy eating the News Chronicle. The sight of two children eating a newspaper rather disturbed Lionel <laughs> and, 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 and he wasn't able to concentrate on the theory of international trade. Uh, later on, the, uh, the, the children brought up the, the, the News Chronicle <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Lerner came in, tidied up things and uh, all this time Abba was discussing the theory of international trade and was completely uh, undisturbed by what was going on. He was a man devoted to economic theory. Uh, well, uh, as I say, at this stage it was uh, likely that, that I, I would uh, uh, become a lawyer rather than, than an economist and for a very special reason. As it happened, I had passed the examinations of the University of London for the subjects taken in the first year while still at school, high school as it would be called here. As a result, since three years residence of the university were required before a degree could be granted, I had to continue in residence at LSE for another year before obtaining my degree. I decided to spend the additional year studying industrial law. However, no doubt as a result of Plant's influence, I was granted by the University of London a Sir Ernest Castle travelling scholarship for the next year. I had been interested in the question of why industries were organised in different ways and I decided to go to the United States to study this question working under plant supervision, the requirement of residence at LSE being somewhat loosely interpreted. <laughs> I could have chosen any country. That I chose to go to the United States was, I feel sure, due to the fact that most of the literature on business administration and industrial organization was American. That I am able to give an account of what I did there is due to the fact that I corresponded with Ronald Fowler my friend and fellow student, and he had kept many of my letters as well as drafts of his replies. My aim while in America was to find an explanation for why industries were organized in such different ways, the problem of vertical and lateral integration, as I put it. I also took with me another problem. Plant was opposed to government schemes for coordinating production. The pricing system would do all the coordination necessary. Yet, in his lectures on business administration, he spoke of management as coordinating the work of the various factors of production used in the firm. How could one recognize, reconcile these different approaches? Why didn't the pricing system make the firm unnecessary? Here in my investigations, I benefited, benefited from having taken a Bachelor of Commerce rather than an economics degree. With all its faults, we did get acquainted with what went on in business in the real world. The result was that when I went to America, I did not spend most of my time visiting economists in American universities. Indeed, in one of my letters to Fowler, I refer to the views of academics as bilge. <laughs> what I did was to visit factories and businesses and discuss with businessmen the problems that vex me. I could do this because of my BCom training. By the summer of 1932, I got the answer to my question. Why were some operations coordinated within the firm by management while others came about as a result of market transactions. 
the pricing system or use of the market was not free. You had to find another partner into an exchange, negotiate with him, draw up contracts, monitor the performance, and so on. This was costly. It was the comparison of these costs, transaction costs, as they, uh, they have come to be called, with the costs of carrying out the same operations within the firm that determined which would be chosen. This was all very simple, but it had not been seen before, largely because the existence of firms had been taken for granted. The explicit introduction of the concept of transaction costs was also to play an important part in the analysis of the working of the economic system and in uh, law and economics. But all this was to come many years later. When I returned from America, I was appointed an assistant lecturer at the Dundee School of Economics and Commerce, no doubt as a result of, of Arnold Plant's recommendations. I described the contents of my, I described the contents of my uh, first lecture in a letter I wrote to Ronald Fowler. It was the first lecture in a course on the organization of the business unit. What we find there is the argument of the nature of the firm. I comment in my letter to Fowler, as it was a new approach, I think, to this subject, I was quite pleased with myself. One thing I can say is that I made it all up myself. As I said in my Stockholm lecture, I was then 21 and the sun never ceased to shine. In 1934, while still at Dundee, I completed the first draft of The Nature of the Firm, revised it in 1936 after I joined the economics department at LSE, and it was published in Economica in 1937. How it was received by my elders and betters is, I think, extremely instructive. On the day the article was published, on the way to lunch, the two professors of commerce, one of whom was Plant, congratulated me on the article, but never referred to it again. The professor of banking, whose name I suppress, said somewhat sarcastically that it smelled of the lamp, by which he meant that it was an academic exercise without real significance. Lionel Robbins, the head of the economics department, of which I was a ne member, never referred to the, uh, the article ever, and neither did Hayek, although uh, my relations with them was, was quite, quite cordial. The only support I got was from my contemporaries, particularly from my friend Ronald Fowler and from Duncan Black, who had been the fellow assistant lecturer with me in Dundee. If this tale has any general significance, it is that new ideas are most likely to come from the young, who are also the group most likely to recognize the significance of those ideas. Professors like Plant may get you going and provide the essential support in the early stages. But once you get going, it is the interchange with your contemporaries that really matters. It is the interchange in a student body that is the cauldron of discovery. I now turn to the problem of, of social cost, where the tale is completely different, but the lesson to be drawn from it is much the same. When I was appointed an assistant lecturer at the London School of Economics in 1935, my teaching duties included giving a course on the economics of public utilities. I soon found that very little was known about the subject in Britain, and I began a series of historical studies of water, gas, electricity, the post office, and broadcasting to find out what the facts were.